Welcome everyone to today's webinar. I have been asked to discuss the importance of attendance notes when taking instructions and preparing a will. So first and foremost, why is it important to discuss this topic? Other than general good farm management and an aid memoir on conversations that have taken place, it can also protect against negligence claims. And in the world of contentious probate matters, it is a key piece of evidence. It is the core evidence used in probate disputes as illustrated by the current slide. So I'm sure you're wondering why I'm here to discuss this topic when I don't write wills. As a contentious probate lawyer, we tend to see it all, the good, the bad and the ugly. Whatever side of the dispute we sit on, the will file tends to hold key evidence and information. Once a testator has passed away, they are no longer able to give evidence about what it is they wanted to happen to their estate. So we turn to the will file for that evidence. However, the will file is only as good as the person who prepared it. A will file lacking in information will not help anyone understand what it was that the testator wanted, nor would it show that the will writer carefully considered the relevant legal principles that surround the creation of a will, all of which leaves the testator at risk of their estate being challenged or their instructions being misunderstood, the will writer at risk of a negligence claim and the estate at risk of a probate dispute. When acting for a claimant, probate dispute lawyers look to pull apart every sentence written in a will file. It does not necessarily mean that the will writer has been negligent, but if the attendance notes lack information and evidence that the relevant legal principles were considered and or followed where required, the claimant's case is bolstered almost immediately, adding time and expense in responding to a claim that otherwise may have been discontinued if the will file contained detailed attendance notes. And so to help the will writers uh, listening today, uh, I anticipate some of the key questions you're contemplating are the following. What do you want to see in a will file as a contentious probate specialist? What can you do to protect yourselves? And what can help prevent a potential claim? To begin with, I anticipate it would be helpful to discuss the general principles, particularly as I'm sure many of you, especially those who have not yet had the pleasure of being pulled into a dispute, might be thinking, why does it matter what's in my will file? It's confidential and subject to legal professional privilege. It's good to start with a case you may have heard of known as Lark v Nugus. This was a case about the estate of Elsie Moss. The first claimant was her solicitor, Mr Lark, who prepared the will which was executed by Elsie on the 1st of May 1973. In her will, Elsie left her house to Mr and Mrs Lucas, a couple who had been engaged to look after her from March 1973 onwards. She also left pecuniary legacies to various persons, including the two defendants, Henrietta Nugus, Elsie's niece, and Thomas Jordan. Her residuary estate was left to various charities. Elsie passed away just over two months after her will was executed in July 1973, aged 80. Soon after Elsie's death, Ms Nugas contacted the solicitor who wrote to Mr Lark and requested a copy of the will. They subsequently made five requests between the 3rd of August and 18th of December 1973 for that will and all were refused. In January 1974, having still found difficulty in gaining an insight into Elsie's wishes, Ms Nugas's solicitor entered a caveat. In March 1974, Mr Lark applied for probate, but due to the caveat was required to commence a probate action to propound the will. This began in July 1974. The claim was not responded to until November 1974, when the defendant stated that Elsie did not know and approve the contents of her will and, in the alternative, that the execution of the will was obtained by undue influence on the part of Mr and Mrs Lucas. As can often be the case in claims such as this, the dispute progressed for a number of years. It was not until around November 1975, almost two and a half years after Elsie's death, that a request was made for Mr Lark to provide a statement of his evidence concerning the execution of the will and all relevant circumstances surrounding that execution. Mr, Legree, Mr. Lark agreed to put the request to his barrister but subsequently did not respond. Accordingly, a further request was made in May 1977 and still no response. The matter was listed to be heard in court around two months later on the 21st of July 1977, at which time the information surrounding the will came to light for the first time. 
some four years after Elsie's death. On hearing some of the evidence, the judge was concerned that the defendants had no interest in pursuing an undue influence claim, as a successor otherwise of that claim would not change their position. And so it was agreed they would drop that claim. And in doing so, the hearing was then adjourned until December 1977, when the parties would be called back for the judge to hear further evidence relating to their claim that Elsie did not know and approve the content of her will. As it happens, by the time the second hearing came around, the second defendant, Mr Jordan, had died, albeit back in October 1975, and Ms Nugas had decided to drop all claims against the estate, having heard the evidence of one of the witnesses and from Mr Lark explaining the circumstances surrounding Elsie's will preparation and execution. As this brought an end to the dispute, this then left open the question of costs, the dispute having lasted some four and a half years. The judge held that had Ms Nuga solely brought a claim raising concerns surrounding the execution of the will, she would have been entitled to her cost in their entirety. This is a stark warning to will writers, as Mr Lark would have been responsible for Ms Nugas's costs in those circumstances. However, somewhat luckily for Mr Lark, albeit he did not see it at the time, as Ms Nugas had also pleaded undue influence, the judge felt that she had lost this claim by being required to withdraw it, and so should not be entitled to her cost for that element. Essentially, Ms Nugas had been successful with one claim, but had failed with the other. Given that the costs were difficult to untangle, and it appears neither party put forward evidence explaining the cost incurred in relation to each claim, the judge decided to make an order uh, with no order as to costs. This meant that the parties were responsible for their own costs and could not recover those costs from the other party. I said earlier that Mr Lark did not appreciate the position at the time. This is because he subsequently appealed the cost decision, stating that the undue influence costs far outweighed the cost incurred in dealing with Ms Nugas's other claim, essentially trying to gain a cost award in his favour. Despite this, the appeal court dismissed his claim and upheld the trial judge's decision. Now, while there's no silver bullet in this case, it is clear that had Mr Lark released the information earlier, the claim would not have been necessary, and substantial legal fees would not have been incurred by either party. Early disclosure is therefore key. Equally, Mr Lark was very close to being required to pay Ms Nugas's legal costs, which at the time were likely to be substantial, something that I anticipate strikes fear in most will writers' hearts. Some of the arguments raised in correspondence by Mr Lark during the dispute were that the documents were confidential to the deceased and that he had no obligation to release that information to a third party. This was despite the fact that the legal position at the time was clearly set out, that a solicitor should, if there is a genuine dispute, make available a statement of his evidence about the execution of the will and the circumstances surrounding it to any person who asks him for such a statement, whether or not the solicitor is acting for persons propounding any will of the testator. This has subsequently been repeated in the Law Society's practice note, which I've put up on the following slide. So what does this mean for will writers? Essentially, care needs to be taken as your file can be called into evidence. While the case of Lark v Nugas essentially deals with the release of a will and a statement from the will writer, the will file is regularly requested as it is written evidence from the time the will was prepared. This process of requesting a will file and statement is known as a Lark v Nugas request. Even if the will file isn't called to be disclosed, Depending on the length of time that has passed between the will being prepared and any dispute arising, memories may have faded. Accordingly, it will be necessary to look back over the file in your notes to jog your memory about the test data and the circumstances surrounding the will preparation and execution to enable a statement to be provided. This slide shows the type of questions asked as part of a Lark v Nugas request. As you can see, they cover everything from your first interaction with the test data right through to your last. They also cover key dispute points such as capacity, undue influence, substantial changes to wills, as well as details of your experience level. Getting your attendance note right is therefore vital. So, what should you be putting in your attendance note? First and foremost, keep in mind that your attendance note may one day be a key piece of evidence in a dispute. It may be placed before a judge as part of a court hearing and could be the key piece of evidence that brings an end to the dispute. Even if the notes themselves aren't used specifically as evidence, 
keep in mind that they may be something you need to rely on to remind yourself of this particular test data, particularly when compared to all of the others you will have attended throughout your career. Your notes should therefore be detailed. You should include little notes or bits of information that will help you remind and remember of this particular test data in years to come, essentially an aid memoir. You should consider the test data's capacity and run through the banks and good fellow requirements. Although during a person's lifetime, capacity is dealt with via the Mental Capacity Act, if a dispute arises post-death, it is the banks and good fellow principles that are considered. This was confirmed by the recent case of Clitheroe and Bond in 2020. Essentially, Banks and Goodfellow found that the testator must appreciate that they are making a will and the consequences of that, must understand the extent of their estate, should be able to consider any moral claims on their estate, and must not be affected by any disorder of the mind or insane delusion. These are points that should all, therefore, be covered off during the meeting and recorded in your attendance note. Make sure you're noting down that you have considered the testator's capacity have discussed their family tree, have gone through their previous will or the intestacy rules if there is no will, have considered the size and nature of their estate, that they understand the value of money, a key capacity indicator, and that they are not under the influence of any third party, that they are not being pressured into making this will. It is also important to consider the other issues that may specifically affect the person in front of you. Why has the testator decided to prepare or change their will now? Are they unwell or recently diagnosed with a terminal illness? Do they have hearing or eyesight issues? Can they read? Are they recently bereaved? The case of Key and Key noted on the slide was an important confirmation on the position regarding bereavement and the effect it can have on a person's capacity. Many people do not like to think about their deaths. And so taking the step necessary to prepare a will can be intimidating and overwhelming. Some are also embarrassed by the circumstances. I've come across cases where the testator could not read without their reading glasses, but having left them at home, felt so embarrassed at what they thought would be wasting the will writer's time that they didn't want to mention it. Believe in your gut instincts and feelings. If you feel something may be an issue, don't shy away from it. Discuss it with the testator and make sure to put it in your attendance note. In the example mentioned, the way the solicitor handled their concern was to pass the will to the testator upside down without telling them. They then asked them to read it over. As the testator was unable to see clearly, they pretended to read the will, but inadvertently did so upside down. This gave insight into the situation for the will writer, who was then able to delicately discuss the issue with the testator and read through the will slowly with them instead they were also able to offer them another appointment at a later date when they had their reading glasses. Be alert to the testator's needs. Separately, it is also important to make sure your client understands the process. Is the will being prepared immediately? Do you need more information from them? Do they need to agree your terms before steps are taken? Make sure you note down that you discuss these things within your attendance note and where possible, confirm it in writing using terms and expressions they will understand. Equally, make sure you understand the testator's instructions. What do they want to achieve? Do you understand why it is important to them? Get, get as much information down on paper and make sure the will ultimately reflects that request. Or set out in your attendance note your discussion with the testator about how it's not possible to achieve exactly what they want and why. Importantly, Make sure you consider, discuss and record the instructions, your advice and any concerns you have, or more importantly, didn't have on the testator's instruction. Your understanding of those instructions. Have you interpreted them correctly? On capacity, think about banks and Goodfellow. Undue influence, is anyone pressurising the testator? Has the testator's mind been poisoned? Has someone been drip feeding incorrect and or hurtful information about another beneficiary? with the hope of that other beneficiary being excluded from a will. Consider bereavement. Think of key and key. Has the person recently lost a loved one? The case of key and key tells us that bereavement has the ability to genuinely affect capacity. Is a testator looking to exclude a usual beneficiary? 
Make sure to add in any advice you've given about the 1975 Act. But a word of caution. Be careful simply to note that the person may look to claim, not that they will claim or that they will be successful with any claim, particularly as the legal position may change in the future through case law or legislative changes. A point to note. It is not sufficient to say with hindsight that because you didn't mention their age or capacity concerns, for example, within your attendance note at the time, it categorically means that they had none. Your attendance note should specifically state that you considered capacity, for example, and that you had no concerns. Equally, if you do have concerns, note them down and set out your process and how you came to make the decision to proceed with the will despite this. If the person was elderly, Note whether you discussed with them the best practice of obtaining a medical report or having a doctor sign the will as a witness. Think about the testator's circumstances. So we've now run through what your notes should be covering, but the question remains, when and on what occasion should you prepare an attendance note? I should note, the cartoon is entirely irrelevant. I just felt there'd been a lot of words for a while on the slides and that this may help keep everyone engaged and cheer the conversation. However, to the point in hand, I've seen a number of will files that have no information about how the test data came to have an appointment booked, which makes answering the question of who introduced you to the, to the test data in a Lark v Nugas request, for example, rather difficult to answer. Your file should therefore be as complete and as detailed as possible. Everything telephone calls, emails sent, letters posted, all should be recorded on the file. Any handwritten notes taken during the meeting should also be scanned or saved on the file. You should also be preparing typed attendance notes as soon as possible after each call or meeting. And if they are not prepared on the same day, consider explaining within the typed note when it was prepared and what aid memoir was used to create it. Make sure you have detailed attendance notes for any and all meetings where the test data provides instructions for their will. Equally as important, make sure you have a detailed note of the will signing appointment, assuming you've been involved in that process. Again, who was there? Was the will read out to them? Were the clauses explained? Did they ask questions? Did you have any concerns about capacity or understanding, for example? I fully appreciate that will writing is cost competitive, but as a will writer, you should do everything you can to reduce the risk to you and your company or firm. Preparing detailed attendance notes and taking the time to consider the issues that may arise if a claim is started are all likely to help with this. Accordingly, consider implementing a checklist to work through to make sure you've considered all points and that your attendance notes cover all those points. But be careful not to allow that checklist to become a tick box exercise. Ticking to say you've considered capacity is not as helpful as setting out what you specifically considered, what your thought process was, what your concerns were, if any, and what and why you came to your final decision. As will writers, the courts do not expect you to be medical experts, but they do expect you to comply with the legal principles laid down. So it's important to make sure your file reflects that, especially as judges do not hold back in open court if they feel your notes or file are lacking. It is because of the risk and these potential issues that IDR have created LARC an innovative piece of software that helps anyone writing wills ensure that they ask the right questions and keep the right notes to help wills be more resistant to later claims. It even produces a Lark v Nougat statement at source, which provides users with a traffic light warning dashboard tracking the progress of all wills to execution. It helps limit risk and the cost lost in preparing Lark v Nougat statements as and when they arise. Further details of Lark can be found online at Lark online.co.uk. Additional information can also be found on our website and throughout the IDRN. So, having ran through the legal position and my recommended points to cover in an attendance note, I will leave you with a few final points to consider. As I have already touched upon, your will file and attendance notes can become evidence in a probate dispute, but equally so can you. You could be called to give oral evidence in court as the will writer. This can be many years after the will instructions were taken. Make sure your note covers off aid memoirs that will help you recall the meeting. What was the room like? The journey? What did you eat? What did you wear? Everyone is different, so whatever it is that will help you remember, note it down. Always remember confidentiality. 
While you may be compelled to provide a statement surrounding the circumstances of the will instructions and execution, that is not an open-ended right to hand over the will file and all papers. Confidentiality lasts forever. It does not just end on death. When the testator dies, the executors essentially step into their shoes, meaning the executors take control of deciding whether to agree to release the will file or not. As a will writer, you can be compelled to prepare a Lark v. Nuga statement, but without a court order or the executors' permission, you should not be releasing the will file. Equally, however, and please note this does depend on the circumstances, it would likely be foolish to defend any application made by a claimant to compel the release of the will file. You also need to think about redacting notes and files before sending them. I know a number of will writers who take joint instructions from spouses and civil partners, for example. In that scenario, best practice would be to see them separately and open separate files. However, it is understood that for cost purposes, this is not always the case. Releasing a joint will file on behalf of a Mr A, for example, without Mrs A's permission or the permission of her executors post death, will, however, result in you breaching confidentiality. Care therefore needs to be taken. You also need to consider who owns the file. There's a helpful Law Society practice note on this that essentially covers the situation that letters and correspondence belong to the client, whereas file notes and internal memos made belong to the firm. That is, unless you charge for the preparation of the notes. And in that scenario, these notes then equally become owned by the client. You should consider how long you should retain your file for. The standard six years may not be sufficient to assist if a dispute arose. However, keeping documents long term will need you to consider updating terms and conditions, seeking consent from the test data and potentially renewing that consent regularly. Do also consider the fact that the Law Society practice note states that a will writer can charge a reasonable fee for the preparation of a Lark v. Nugas statement. However, be ready for a disgruntled response to any such request, especially as the term reasonable has not been defined. And finally, don't be afraid to challenge a, test a testator. Ask them questions. Make sure you know what they want and why. Always get a complete family tree. And then all you have to do is just make sure it is all recorded on the file. This brings an end to my discussion around attendance notes today. Thank you all for listening. I hope you found something of use or new in the discussion. I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. Take care.